Tonight on the Astronomy Show, we feature the new comet Yakutaki. Eric Dunn gives us a current report on the comet. Dave Savely takes us to a comet party. And Lee Johnson and Eric Dunn give us a tips on how best to view the comet Yakutaki. Of course, David Dodge with Astro News. All this and more on the Astronomy Show. this month has been the comet, and uh, it's been putting on a glorious show. Comet Hyakutake, 1996 B2, seems destined to become known as the Great Comet of 1996. Uh, you can read through the history of astronomy and you find there's a string of comets that get known as the Great Comet of their particular year with a capital GC. A lot of us thought we might never live to see one because we've had a 20-year drought of good naked eye comets. But Yakutake has definitely uh, come along and fulfilled our expectations. In fact, it's exceeded them. It was predicted to reach a uh, magnitude about 0.2 or so as it approached Earth. It appears to have exceeded that. It actually got slightly into the negative magnitude range. That puts it as bright as the brightest stars in the sky. You can't expect a lot more than that from any comet. And uh, this one has been doing beautifully. It may yet get brighter when it reaches its closest point to the sun in late April. Uh, it could, in principle, be bright enough to be seen in daylight, although in practice this will be extremely difficult and we don't recommend even attempting this. The comet has done well, it has exceeded expectation, it's proven itself to be quite lively as well. Uh, observatories around the world are following this comet, and indeed some of them, the observatories are going around the world. The Hubble Space Telescope has done some important work on this. And even through small telescopes from here on Earth, it is sometimes possible to see interesting things happening near the nucleus of this comet. It formed a quite bright, noticeable spike in the uh, inner regions of the tail, which was followed for several days. And a few knots have broken off, chunks of ice and other things coming off the nucleus of the comet. And these have been seen traveling down the tail and slowly dispersing. This bodes well for the comet's performance over the next little while, because as this dirty iceberg that the comet really is breaks up, it exposes more area to space uh, more to get warmed by the sun, more material sublimates out, and the comet should be, uh, comet's tail should become thicker and brighter. And this ought to be particularly uh, good news for observers. The comet has been compared with a lot of other uh, comets dating back over hundreds of years, and the feeling now is that this is definitely the best one we've had since uh, Comet West in the spring of 1976. Comet Bennett, some six years earlier, was vying with Yakutake right up until the last few nights. And uh, most of the people I've spoken with now feel that this is definitely exceeding Comet Bennett, that uh, only West has really outdone it. Part of the excitement of this is the, uh, the prospect for how this comet will compare with next year's comet. Next spring, by an extraordinary coincidence, again at the same time of year, we'll be getting Comet Hale-Bopp, which is going to be on a very different trajectory. It will never come close to Earth, but it is an enormous comet intrinsically. And it's expected to put on a similarly good show, perhaps even better. So for those of you who had your comet appetites whetted this past month, for those who are going to enjoy the show this coming month, uh, keep in mind that you may get to do it all over again, perhaps even more so, this time next year. So keep hoping for clear skies. Keep those optics dusted off. Keep cruising the internet. There's an awful lot of wonderful images still coming out about this comet from observatories all around the world. And, uh, Enjoy your view of the Great Comet of 1996. Well, we're at the Gordon Sutton Observatory, and supposedly this was going to be an evening to take a look at that famous comet, Akataki. Unfortunately, this is Vancouver. And yes, we can see the moon, and yes, we can see Venus, but we're not seeing much else. But we do still have a lot of people that have decided to come down, and who knows, fingers crossed, maybe it'll clear up, and we will see this beautiful comet a little bit later. We're going to interview some of the people that are using their scopes and find out what they're looking at and talk to some of the public in general.
know, they have come down and asked them what they think about uh, this comet, if they've seen it, and if they have observed it, and just in general see what uh, people are doing. There's a lot of clouds tonight, and I'm not sure we're gonna, whether we're going to see the comet, but I did see the comet with my naked eye from work on Saturday night, and I saw the comet Sunday night from my uh, condo complex with my binoculars, and it was quite spectacular. I've uh, talked to a lot of people that, in general, seem to be excited about this comment. People are discussing it all the time and so on. Yep, Have you noticed that too? Well, there's a lot of um, news media surrounding the comment. A lot of people are aware and a lot of people are coming down here tonight and a lot of people at work are asking me about it. And I took a lot of people at work out on one of the balcony decks there at the hospital and uh, showed some people the comet up in the sky. So yes, I noticed that a lot of people are really excited about it. I am. Well, <laughs> we know, looking at Dan Collier's telescope of the RASC and Dan has uh, hooked up to a TV monitor here. And Dan, this is uh, quite impressive. Uh, we're obviously looking at the moon here. Yes, we are. This is my first attempt to hook up the camera to the moon, so I'm quite gratified that it was this good. But uh, it's not a very sophisticated camera, but it can show quite a lot of detail here, almost as much as you can see with your eyes. I want to see what these youngsters think about it. What's your name, young man? Mick. Mick? Yeah. And what do you think, Mick? Is that pretty impressive? Mm-hmm. And what's your name, young lady? Natasha. And have you seen the moon? Yeah, I have. And what do you think of this? Uh, <laughs> um, I think it's really good. I, I've never seen it like this before. It's fine. Have you youngsters had a chance to see the comet before tonight? No. No. I think we got the duo of the mics here. I'm uh, now talking with Bob Nixon of CBC Television. Bob, what does the reaction mean with the media about this comet hack attacky? Well, you're talking to a guy who works for a station that on Friday night bought some freelance video from uh, a fellow who claimed he had uh, taken a picture of it. And I looked at the video and said, this doesn't look like uh, a comet at all. It looks like Venus. And we paid $100, and it ended up that it was Venus. And our viewers actually seemed to know quite a bit more than we did, because it was on the, uh, within minutes of us showing this on the air, so someone said, nope, Venus. In I terms of our astronomer, I don't believe uh, it. Th no, this is true. You know, I well, I they don't believe me, but you know at, at where I work, I don't understand it. But uh, so in terms of the media, I think it's sort of like we're kind of the same as everybody here. We're just sort of curious to sort of see what's going on and what you know. We're interested in the heavens above, and uh, I'm not really sure that it g goes much deeper than that. We don't have sort of like an astronomy reporter. I guess I'm as close as it gets. A lot of uh, phone calls and people inquiring about the comet in general? Except only when we make a mistake. Just when we make a mistake. Well, we've had a tremendous crowd turn out for Comet Hackataki Night, despite the clouds. And we've actually seen it a couple times very briefly. We're hoping that it's going to clear up a bit more later in the evening. And on behalf of the Astronomy Show, this is Dave Savely saying good night. and a shooting star? Well, a shooting star is more correctly called a meteor, which is a chunk of rock uh, zooming through our atmosphere and burning up with friction. A comet is a lump of something out in space, and it's been called the nearest thing to nothing anything can be and still be something. It's <laughs> hundreds of kilometers away. You're right, yeah, they're almost nothing. They're, there's just a little bit of something there to make it interesting. And what that something is is a mixture of hydrocarbons and uh, organic materials and... Um, and uh, or, um, and minerals, water, and really, really cold frozen gases. But how are we going to make a comet if it's a mixture of nothing? Well, uh, we can't get the real thing here uh, from outer space because uh, it's just darn difficult. But we have some stuff in the kitchen uh, that we can use to recreate that. And I've got that stuff all laid on the table here. What can we find? We've got some... Uh, corn syrup? Corn syrup, yes. That's our organic material. Okay. What else do we have over there? We've got... Uh, that's water. Water, water H2O. The, uh, well, it's a fairly large uh, uh, constituent of the universe. And we've right. got some in this white container. We have some motor oil. petrocan motor oil, the genuine stuff. This is our hydrocarbons. OK. We have some minerals. Can you find some minerals? Kitty litter, that's right. Kitty litter? Kitty litter, right. It's, it's oh just my. dirt and gravel, basically, is what we have in space. Now, uh, we also have some frozen gases. What's that? Whoa, looks cold. Um, Ice. Whoa. Cold. That's right. Dry ice. Frozen carbon dioxide. Be careful not huh. to touch it with your bare hands. You might get frostbite. 
In that thermos, we have... Thermos of hot coffee? Hardly. It's the opposite of hot. It's really, really cold. What we have there is liquid nitrogen. Ever gone to a dermatologist and had a, a, a wart burned I've off? heard that it, you can get warts taken off with that. That's right. That's uh, liquid nitrogen, really, really cold, minus 200 oh. and something. And we're going to pretend that this cold is the cold of outer space. Wow. So what we're going to do, over the next few minutes, we're going to gather this stuff together and mix okay. it all up in our handy-dandy comet-making bin and uh, see what comes out, okay? Okay, So to do this, Great. let's see now. Um, let's take this stuff off the side here. Uh, put the kitty litter off the side. Okay. And we'll just hold on to the corn syrup first. We're going to take the uh, water and the... Well, and the water. And we'll just take a little bit of corn syrup and uh, pour it in. Oh, well, there we go. And just wait for it to come out. Very good. Now, okay. Now we need the, uh, the hydrocarbons. Um, this one. Mm-hmm. Motor oil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we'll need the minerals. So if you the can minerals. take... This. That's minerals, yes. That's very strange. And I have some hydrocarbons. And we just... So is kitty litter really made out of minerals then? Well, you know, dirt's dirt in it. Mm -hmm. Sure, okay. if we look hard enough, we find some minerals in there. Mm. You like oatmeal? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> look like, Looks oatmeal. like oatmeal. <laughs> okay, we'll just let that... Uh, cook for a little bit. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that uh, dry ice and we're going to make it into dry ice snow. And to do that, we need the dry ice snow container. Okay. Okay, there's the dry ice snow container. And now, if you can hand me the dry ice snow maker. Thank you very okay. much. You want to do this? Sure. <laughs> okay. What do you think? Looks pretty good to me. Whoa. All right. Okay, so, Sarah, if I can get That's you... That's amazing. ...to, uh, let's... Put some in? Pour some in. I'll have to use my gloves, okay? Okay. Just, there she go. All right. All right, we'll mix it all up. A bit, a bit lumpy. Okay, now there's one thing, one very important constituent missing here. Uh-huh. What do you think Water? that is? Water, exactly. Just a second here. Okay. Now, safety first here, since we're going to be dealing with uh, pyrotechnics, I think there's some uh, uh, face mask behind you, and I've got some goggles here I'm going to put on. Okay. Okay. Ready? Stand back. Ready. Okay. Oh, good, it's leaking. Now, what we don't have is the deep cold of outer space. So before we finish with our comet, we've got to get the deep cold of outer space. Okay. And do you have any deep cold there, Sarah? Yep. Okay. Liquid nitrogen. Stand back. That's good. I am a professional. Do not do this at home. Oh, my God. The steam's freezing, too. And there we go. Out comes the comet. That's amazing. See the gas is running away? That's the, uh, the, oh, the, yeah. that's the, uh, the frozen carbon dioxide changing from a frozen gas to a gaseous gas. That looks like the tail. That is the tail of the comet. As the gas gets driven off by the sun. That's amazing. Can I, can I hold sure. it? Sure. Oh, it's freezing. Is this how cold it would be to live in outer space? No, it's a lot colder than that. It's, as close, it's about as cold as we can get under these circumstances. Well, comet fever has been sweeping the sky over the last month, as has Comet Yakutake. It's been putting on a wonderful show, and the show is not yet over, despite uh, popular misconceptions to that effect. With us in the studio tonight, we have uh, Lee Johnson. And Lee, you've been watching the comet uh, 
been enjoying the show, I think. Uh, what can you tell us about viewing the comet? We've had a lot of questions. I think anybody who knows anything about astronomy has been peppered with them over the last month. Uh, and I'd like to see how you're responding to some of them. For example, uh, where do we go to see the comet? Well, this particular comet has been sweeping across the skies from the east, heading towards the sun, and during the month of April, we'll be chasing the sun, and so that after sunset, we can start watching for the comet in the northwest skies. What we will see as we look in that direction is a comet that is farther away from Earth, but closer to the sun, and as a result, possibly growing brighter as it warms up and it will approach uh, perihelion on May 1st, uh, perhaps bubbling right away by the time it reaches that point in its orbit. Of course, by May 1st, the comet will be behind the sun and we will no longer see it. However, we will have some admirable opportunities to view this comet during the new moon time of mid-April. At that point, the comet should be very bright and its tail will be much more evident uh, to look at than it probably has been even during the month of March. Uh, for example, I have with me a model of a comet that I've borrowed with the kind permission of my cats. It's a cat toy, and we'll pretend that this is a comet. Uh, here is the coma, or the head of the comet, and here is the tail of the comet. And what has happened during the month of March, as the comet has gone by us, is that we have been looking at it flying overhead we see the coma, or the head of the comet, and we see the tail extending upwards beyond that. As the comet nears the sun in the month of April, we will see the tail more on its face facing us, and we will probably be able to see it much better defined than we did in the month of March. As a result, an important moral to draw from the observing of a comet is to follow it through its entire trajectory, its entire life in our skies. It keeps changing as our viewpoint or our perspective on the comet changes. It keeps changing as the comet changes temperature, as it nears the sun. And so this comet may very likely put on its best show uh, in a, in sometime in the month of April. So it's not over yet. Well, Lee, a lot of people will go to great lengths to see the sort of thing that appears in the sky once every 20 years. Just what kind of lengths should one go to to see this comet? Uh, do you need to drive for hours to get away from the city lights? Uh, is there any chance of seeing it from urban areas? Should we go for suburban areas? What, what, is this, uh, what does the observing picture look like? Well, let's talk about the best way to observe comets, especially a big bright comet such as this, which has been considered the finest comet to grace our skies since Comet West in 1976. The best thing to do with a large bright comet is first of all to go to as dark a sky as you can. If you live in the city, go to a nearby park and give your eyes time to become used to the dark, to become dark adapted. This takes what, 15, 20 minutes at least? Yes, about 15, 20 minutes, half an hour if possible. A better thing to do of course is to drive for an hour or so away from the city lights, uh, go out under some dark skies and take a look at the comet there. From the city, what you will see as you look off to the northwest in the month of April is a fuzzy glowing object that looks a bit like a motorcycle headlight through the fog at some distance from you. But as you go out to the countryside, you will see more and more of the comet's tail. Uh, in particular, in dark skies, people have noticed as much as a 40 degree tail on this comet as it went by in the month of March. It's very likely to do even better in the month of April if all goes well. Now, 40 degree tail, we're not talking about temperature here. You're speaking about uh, the oh. angular extent on the sky. That means, what, about halfway across the sky, a quarter of the way across the sky? Well, we can see roughly 180 degrees of the sky, uh, taking a little bit off for the horizon. So a 40 degree tail is nearly a quarter of the distance across the sky. And the best way to look at a comet in that way is with the naked eye. That way you can take in as much of the comet and its tail as possible. There is no optical instrument with a 40 degree wide field of view after all. No, there is not. The best way to look at a bright comet is with a pair of binoculars. Even from the city, a pair of binoculars will be extremely useful. Binoculars characteristically, even small ones like this, gather between 50 and 100 times more light than the dark adapted human eye. As a consequence, we can see more from the city. 
with, through binoculars, and we can see sometimes with the naked eye in a darker sight. So use binoculars, but your review of uh, a comet will be restricted to about seven degrees, typically, through binoculars. And uh, the naked eye would be able to see, uh, in dark skies, a 30 or 40 degree tail. The least useful instrument in some ways is a telescope, because that will only give you a view of the coma, or the head of the comet, in a small field. So comets are basically a low overhead item to observe. Use the human eye, go to a dark site, or use a pair of household binoculars. Certainly, if you have the good luck to live in a place far from city lights with a nice unpolluted sky, uh, the naked eye is probably the best uh, instrument to use for this comet. Most of the tail is extremely faint, and you lose pretty well all of that faint tail in the brightly lit skies over the city, and that's where you can really use the binoculars to uh, increase that brightness to give you a better view of the head of the comet, the part you can see. Is there anything that uh, one should use with, in conjunction with binoculars, that might help uh, get a look at the comet, Lee? Well, one thing that you could use, uh, we have uh, here uh, an example of giant binoculars. And they're mounted on something like a camera tripod, because these binoculars are so big and magnificent and yet so heavy that they're very hard to hold steadily for any length of time. So if you have a pair of binoculars, uh, and if you can mount them on a tripod, uh, it will make your viewing much more comfortable and much more uh, steady and stable. It's also very helpful if you're trying to show the comet to someone else who may not be into uh, locating it in the sky. You can, of course, aim the binoculars, leave it on the tripod, and they can come up and have a look through it. Also rather nice if you're very short and like to get revenge on your tall friends, you set up the binoculars for your own convenience, and then they get back trouble trying to look through them. But that's perhaps another story. Lee, uh, where will we find this comet in the next month? Uh, people, a lot of people are under the mistaken impression that it has done its entire thing in March, uh, but it is visible in the northern hemisphere for at least another month yet, is it not? Where should we see it? Yes, it is, and it is chasing the sun, so we will look for it after sunset up in the northwest sky. We, we don't should have to stay up all night for this one. No, a lot of people were keeping late nights in March to see the comet, but that's no longer the case. There is no excuse for not seeing this comet. True. Uh, all you have to do is look for it before you go to bed at night uh, in the northwestern sky, and it should be there. The other thing that we can say at this point is that this comet is a good practice comet for us to use, to get used to, uh, knowing how to observe comets, because there's another one coming through a year from now, Comet hale bopp uh, which may be uh, every bit as bright, it will certainly be very different, and this is a good way to get our observing skills going when we look at comets in our night skies. Very good point. It's just about the same time of year next year that hail bop will be in the skies. We'll have the same sort of weather and temperature conditions to cope with, and uh, presumably the lighting situation around where you live will be not much different, so you'll be able to find out uh, the good comet watching locations and practice your uh, comet watching techniques. So dust off those binoculars and uh, get out there when the weather is good. Have another look at Comet Yakutake. It won't be back for another 20,000 years, but you should have a good chance to see some more comets uh, before this decade is out. Welcome back to the Astronomy Show, and this is the afternoon section. Well, today I'm going to be talking about the comet. I'm also going to be talking about the moon, a lunar eclipse, a solar eclipse, and a few chosen planets. What do you think about that comet? Wasn't that spectacular? I think just about every amateur astronomer and every professional astronomer around the world was really pleased with that comet. It exceeded our conservative expectations. In the countryside, the tail was over 50 degrees long. That's five fist distances across the sky. That's huge. In the city, the comet was very well received by thousands of people down at the McMillan Planetarium. I hope you had a chance to observe the comet. If you didn't see this comet, but had a, an interest in the comet, then just wait for next year when Comet Hale bops in our sky. It's going to be in our sky about the same time as Comet Hyakutake was and about the same part of the sky, so we'll call this sort of a pretest on comets, if you wish. And now for the faces of the moon. The uh, full moon will be on the 3rd. The uh, last quarter will be on the 10th. The new moon will be on the 17th. And the first quarter will be on the 25th. On the 20th, look for the thin crescent moon crossing the face of Taurus the Bull. Taurus the Bull's face is made up by a, a group of stars in the shape of the letter V. The group of stars is called the, the Hyades, and the star that marks the, the, the upper right-hand corner star 
is a red star marking the eye of the bull. On the 20th, the thin crescent moon is going to go across the Hyades. The bull, the, the bull Taurus the bull, also is home of Venus, the brightest star in the, in the skies these days. And it's also, Venus is also close to a group of stars in Taurus the bull called the Pleiades. Now on the 23rd and the 24th, we have a golden opportunity to see one of the fastest part members of our solar system, Mercury. On those two days, Mercury will be not too far below the Pleiades. So look for Venus. Below Venus, you'll see a group of stars, the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, and below them on the 23rd and the 24th will be a very bright star, and that will be the planet Mercury. On the 10th, the last quarter moon will be just above Jupiter, the second brightest planet in our solar system. So for those early risers in our audience who want to see Jupiter, the 10th would be a good time to identify Jupiter, because that'll be a bright star near the last quarter moon. Well, don't forget to set your clocks forward one hour before you go to bed on the evening of the 6th. As a matter of fact, tonight, after the astronomy show, set your clocks forward, because at 2 o'clock in the morning on the first Sunday of April, which is the 7th, this go around, we change to Pacific Daylight Time. We stay at Pacific Daylight Time until the last Sunday in October, October 27th. So remember these the next time you want to remember when we change the daylight savings time. The first Sunday in April to the last Sunday in October, we spring forward and fall back. Well, that's it for Astro News. Till next time.